So here we start again with our recording um, of the second live session. Unfortunately, the first part um, of our session was not recorded for some technical reason. I don't know why, but uh, <laughs> so we stopped talking about um, the different kind of evolutionary steps in the development of marketing as a science. And uh, the first step was the production orientation at uh, along with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And we talked about Henry Ford in 1908, the um, invention of the assembly line. And we uh, were using the example of Apple to demonstrate that the division of labor, which has been invented by uh, Adam Smith in his um, popular book uh, written in 1776, Wealth of Nations, is the backbone, is the underlying concept for reducing production costs substantially. So um, that was the first step here. The second step is the sales orientation. And here we go to the next slide. Um, and that is basically the difference between marketing orientation and sales orientation. A lot of people in real life in the organizations, they're saying, yeah, we're doing marketing because we have all these uh, interesting uh, brochures and we have radio commercials and we have TV commercials, etc., etc. However, in reality, sales is often prevailing and marketing is predominantly only regarding as a means to increase turnover, but it's not. Um, in marketing, we are differentiating between two different approaches. One is called the sales approach, but the marketing approach is something different. So in a sales orientation, going back to this slide here, sales I'm now contrasting the marketing orientation and the sales uh, orientation. In a sales approach, in a sales orientation, the main focus is on the products of the organization. And what are you trying to do? You try to increase sales and turnover and profitability, of course, in the end, uh, by selling the products through marketing techniques uh, that you are producing. For example, you're using brochures, you're using clever pricing strategies, you're using social media and advertisement, etc., etc. However, this is not marketing. This is what we call a push approach. A push approach is you try to push the products which you're producing into the market. But marketing approach is completely different. Marketing approach means you the main focus is on the customer needs and wants, and then you design products and services to solve their problems. And then in the end, you have the same accomplishment of goals. So profitability, but through customer satisfaction, not through sales increase. So that is the big difference between sales and marketing. Sales aims at selling the products which you're producing. Marketing aims at producing the products which you can sell. I say it again, in a push approach, in a sales approach, you're trying to sell the products which you're producing in a marketing approach, you're trying to produce the products which you can sell. What is the big advantage in the marketing approach? The big advantage is, of course, that if you're directing your entire focus of the organization towards the customer's needs and wants, you don't need to sell because the products sell automatically to the consumer because the consumer realizes that there's a problem being solved. There's a problem being solved. You don't need to market that. So this, therefore it's called a pull approach. Who's pulling? The customer is pulling because the customer is pulling the products out of the shelves of the organization. And uh, this is what is, the customer is not asking necessarily for uh, concrete products, but always the customers, they're having certain kind of issues, certain kind of problems. And um, this is what you need to tackle. This is what the marketing is all about. Marketing is about directing every activity of the entire corporation towards the customer and their specific problems, their specific needs, and come out with solutions to tackle those problems. Because then the customer will automatically realize that his or her problems are being addressed and calling for those products and services automatically. So that is very important to understand that. 
Um, I always like to tell a story in this uh, in this respect to make it more clear. Um, I tell you a story about uh, about beer. Uh, Bex is a German beer brand, and they invented a Bex Gold. Bex Gold is a very um, refreshing, very light uh, German beer. So, what they did was uh, when they introduced Bex Gold into the market a couple of years ago, they did not invent or, or, or renovate uh, I don't know a new kind of formula for beer, but their goal was we want to increase the percentage of women drinking beer so they were looking at the current percentage of women drinking beer in general and in particular looking at the Bex brand and then they went to women and asked do you drink beer and majority of women 98 percent said no i don't like it and then they said what is your problem with beer and a lot of women said, for example, it doesn't look very elegant. If you hold a beer bottle in your hand and you drink, it's not very ladylike, right? It doesn't look nice. And so if I'm in the bar, if I'm dressed up, whatever, um, it doesn't look nice. I don't like the, the look and feel of the bottle. And indeed, if you go back, beer was bottled in Germany only so German beer only in brown and green glass bottles. Why? Because to protect the product from ultraviolet light. Therefore, it was only filled up in brown and green glass bottles. And this is what women didn't like. So the first step of Bex was we need to get rid of the brown and green glass and we want to make a crystal white appealing glass and then women said and by the way i don't like the taste now why don't you like the taste yeah it's it's too herb it, 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 i don't know it's too strong it's not smooth enough and then the backs people s s thought about that and said okay we need to bring out something smooth so what they did in the end they were um coming out with a beer in a crystal um, clear bottle, which has the same ultraviolet lights protection, which tasted very, very smoothly. And they were not gi uh, giving it to the supermarkets, but they were doing first a test. So they went to 500 different bars and restaurants in Germany. Just Hamburg has more than 5,000. So just 500 restaurants and bars in Germany. And they had women try the beer out. So they said, oh, we have a new kind of beer here, Bex Gold, it's called. Give it a try. And it was a hot summer. And some ladies said, no, I still, still don't like. And some women said, oh, wow, this is cool, interesting, smooth taste. I like it. Cool. Good good for partying, etc., etc." So what they did, they did this over a period of six weeks. What happened? A lot of ladies, many women who loved the beer, the Bex Gold, they went into the supermarkets and they asked for Bex Gold. But the supermarket people said, Bex Gold, I don't know, I've never heard about Bex Gold. And more and more women came into the supermarkets. And after six weeks, the salespersons of, uh, of Bex, when they visited the uh, supermarket, they didn't have to open their mouth because the supermarket managers, they were shouting at them, what did you do with the Bex Gold? Yeah, I wanted to tell you about this is a new kind of product. Please give me 20,000 bottles. Because already today I had 10 women asking for that. Give it to me. So they were pulling the Bex Gold product out of the hands of the manufacturer, of the producer of Bex, without Bex having to spend any kind of sales effort here. That is a cool marketing story. And that is, a, that is the big difference, I hope I made it very clear now, between the push approach and the marketing approach and the pull approach. <clears throat> also, that is a lovely quote. I love that. Uh, it is it is coming from the founder of Revlon Cosmetics, Charles Revson. And Charles was saying, in our factories, we are producing products. We are making cosmetics. In our shops, 
we sell hope. And that is, this is precisely what marketing is also about. Not to sell hope to people, but um, we are, uh, when we discuss that um, at the example of Porsche or uh, Davidov, it became clear, I hope so, um, that marketing people, they are communicating a value proposition to the customer. And this is also what we call, open the blackboard again, I hope this works now and uh, nothing's crashing here and we don't lose that. So <clears throat> we have a customer value proposition, a CVP, customer value proposition. CVP. This is what we are what what we are suggesting. Um, so you need to focus on the needs and wants of the customers and regard products as a means to solve their problems. That is that is the big art. That is the big art. Um, if you just um, also cling to the functional benefits of products, this is not very interesting. This is not very interesting to the um, to the people. What do I mean by that? If you, um, for example, if you have toothpaste, the example of toothpaste, and you're telling customers, our toothpaste um, protects teeth or your, your, protects your body from getting parodontosis or uh, something like that, right? And um, your teeth stay healthy. Okay, but what is interesting about that? Everybody is suggesting the same kind of story. If you're saying that uh, looking at the problems that, for example, smokers have or people who drink a lot of tea in, uh, in the afternoon or coffee in the morning, so um, their teeth get different kind of color. So they're getting more into the yellow thing. But our toothpaste is specifically made to get away of... Uh, of yellow color out of the teeth if you're a heavy tea drinker or smoker or coffee drinker and this makes you more appealing and more attractive to women that is much more compelling that is a much stronger customer value proposition so whatever um, whatever product we are marketing we have to think about what are higher motives of um, consumers and customers not not the explicit benefit of a product is important but more the implicit benefit so what higher uh, motives may be associated to a certain kind of product um, <clears throat> i tell you another story in this uh, in this respect uh, when i was recently i was uh, i was touring um, in asia I was uh, in Myanmar, for example, I was in Philippines, I was in uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, all for presentation. And in, uh, in Myanmar, it happened to me um, that I was seeing a lot of gentlemen, business people, and they were running around with uh, Mont Blanc pencils. They had all Mont Blanc pens. And, uh, Interestingly, what they had was they had their Mont Blanc pen and they had shirts um, with a pocket and they all had their um, Mont Blanc pens in the pocket. Um, and I said, oh, isn't that a bit dangerous? Because if, if, if it's a uh, fountain pen, <laughs> the shirt may get very kind of uh, different kind of blue here. Uh, so <laughs> why are you wearing it like that? And he said, oh, it's a starter symbol. I'm actually I'm not writing with with this kind of pen. I have a I have a, I have a better pen. <laughs> this is not for writing. It's just to show my status to other management to other management people. So the functional benefit of being able to write with a pen was not important for him at all. But it was more an implicit benefit. So it was showing a certain kind of status. And that is also uh, going back to the fact which we discussed um, last time, last week, um, that it is not so much about um, the functional benefit. So Porsche, yeah, nobody needs a Porsche Cayenne Turbo in California. We discussed that. However, quoting it again, Ferdinand Porsche, we build cars. Nobody needs, nobody needs such a, such a, uh, such a quick car. 
but everybody wants. Why do you want that? Because of the power of the brand and what is coming along with the brand, what constitutes the brand identity. Yeah, that is it. That is it. What counts in the end. And what what uh, this is heavily influenced, of course, by customer percep perception. I was once working for a company called uh, La Mer, and probably you heard about La Mer before. It is super expensive. It's uh, like La Prairie. And um, if you Google La Mer, you find very, very expensive products coming from La Mer. And I once read a test when I was working for La Mer, and the test was about La Mer product, and it was also about Nivea. And the test uh, was coming from a famous uh, magazine in Germany. And the test ran that the La Mer product was rated equally good as the Nivea product, although La Mer was more than 300 times the price of the Nivea, of the classic Nivea cream. And I was a bit shocked. So I went to the director and I said, sir, a catastrophe happened. And he said, what's, what's, what's wrong? What's the matter? And I said, look at the test of the magazine. Um, La Mer is rated good. Um, Nivea is rated good. So I don't know what is happening here. Is our product of the same quality as Nivea or the other way around? Is Nivea of the same quality as our product? And he said, Mark, don't worry about it. Not a problem. I said, why is it not a problem? Yeah, he said, uh, you don't need to worry about the, uh, the quality of the product because the quality of the product is not important. And I said, wow, what is he telling me? The quality of the product is not important. He was making a rhetoric break and he said, it is only important how the quality of our product is perceived by the customer. It took me years to understand that. So it is only important how the quality of our product is perceived by the customer. So the customer decides and perceptions of the customer uh, these are the most decisive elements when it comes to the quality of the product Bec because who can say whether a Daimler is better than BMW is better than Audi or the other way around? Nobody knows, right? But it depends on the perception of the customer. So and looking back at Yamaha or looking uh, at the Yamaha, uh, Harley Davidson example. Harley Davidson is not necessarily the better motorcycle, but it's perceived to be more advantageous, more uh, transporting and communicating the American way of life, the feeling of freedom, indi individuality, etc., etc. And because there are more emotions attached to the brand, the brand is more successful. So the quality there is not the most decisive element. Shouldn't shouldn't say that you're selling, should be selling crap products or inferior products. But what is more important is what kind of quality, what kind of emotions are coming across with the brand? What is the brand identity like? And the second thing he told me was, by the way, we're not selling products. And I said, now he's completely out of, his, out of his mind. Let's help him. Let's call 911. Um, let's call the doctor. Uh, and he said, we are selling promises. The promise of beauty, of staying attractive and young to the opposite sex. This is what we are selling. We're not selling cosmetics. Um, this is in line with this, uh, with this famous uh, quote coming from Charles Revson. I love that because that is all about marketing. Marketing is not to fool the customers, but marketing is to look at customers' problems, look also at their implicit motives, so motives that are not explicitly articulated, and come out with products and services as a means to solve those problems. So the marketing process is first to understand the marketplace and customer needs and wants, then design a customer driven marketing strategy. So not have products and try to think about, oh, what is cool about my products and then sell it to the customer. But first think about their problems from a customer perspective, come out with problem, uh, with problem solving products or services. Then design a customer driven marketing strategy, construct an integrated program that delivers superior value. So you have to think about all the P's in marketing. We talked about that, the four P's, product, price, place, and promotion. 
and you need to build in the end profitable relationships and create customer delight. And that is what marketing is all about. How is customer value being created in, in the end then? It is very simply uh, speaking uh, an equilibrium or uh, you, can, you can call it a balance sheet. On the one hand side, there are benefits. So benefits could be derived out of products. So a certain kind of product delivers uh, a benefit to me. It could also be a service that a company is offering to me. It could also be a, a relational benefit. Or it could be an image benefit. So I'm benefiting, for example, this senior executive in Myanmar uh, was benefiting from using or from purchasing the Mont Blanc pen in order to have a tool to signal to other people how senior and how successful he is. And by the way, all those people have it. And if they, <laughs> and if they, um, are not wearing a shirt uh, like I'm doing now and they, or, or they have a jacket, so they're wearing suit. They put really, they put the pen in the suit outside. In Germany, no, nobody basically, nobody would do that, right? But he, there, it was, it was common to do that. So you can really see the level of hierarchy that the managers had there, that they were attending my presentation. You can see that who of them, which of them had the Mont Blanc pen outside of a suit jacket. Very interesting. And so this needs to be greater than the negative. So then the perceived sacrifices. So sacrifice is not only the money you have to pay for the product or the service, but also the time it takes to purchase a product. So if you have to, um, be very very much uh, spending a lot of time to go into the shop and look for different kind of products and then you purchase and then uh, I don't know you don't have money you but they're not accepting credit card and you need to go to the um, to the cash machine you know need to go back etc etc so this can be a, a horror for some people energy costs and psychological costs of running around so that is, by the way, what, what Alibaba does great or what, what, uh, what made Amazon great and those kind of corporations in the online. Um, it, is not so much, it is not so much the monetary cost. So not always uh, has Amazon got a better price than the traditional retail. However, um, the time cost is very, it's very convenient to shop at Alibaba, to shop Amazon, to shop online in general. And uh, this is perceived by some as a great benefit. It's a good service. And here the sacrifice is very high to go into a car or to go by public transport into the city and to shop at normal retail. So whenever the um, perceived benefits are greater than the sacrifices, customer value is being created. Another very important aspect here um, is the Kano model. The Kano model is a strategic tool in management which explains um, how customer satisfaction is being created. Basically there are three factors. One <coughs> factor or one dimension um, is called must be factors. So if the must be factors of a product are being met or they're over fulfilled no big customer delight is being created. So here you have on this axis, you have this customer satisfaction. Um, but here, presence of ful fulfillment. Um, so if, if you very much fulfill here, the must be characteristics, there's not a big satisfaction being created. So people are just neutral about that. Um, so I'm making it tangible, uh, talking about car and airbags or safety. Um, if you think about a car, uh, let's assume you want to buy a car with me and I'm BMW dealer and you go come to me and say, oh, sir, I want to buy a new car. And I said, yeah, we have here um, BMW car, uh, five series model. And uh, but I have to tell you, um, the car has no airbags. It's a new kind of strategy we have. And then you're talking to me and say, are you kidding me? The car has no airbags. 
Every car should have an airbag. That's a must have, right? Are you kidding me? Are you insane? I'm not, not going to buy any of your cars, right? So if um, the must be characteristics are absent, then extreme dissatisfaction is created. If I'm saying to the customer, if, if you're my customer, you're coming to me and say, can you imagine the BMW 5 Series model has got four airbags? Then you say, four airbags? But every car has four airbags, right? Even my bicycle has four airbags. That's not a big thing. That's not a wow factor. Go home. So this is must be characteristics. So you only need to fulfill them um, in, uh, in such a way that they are not tarnishing, that they are not demoting so much um, the satisfaction of the customer. Um, and then there are so-called <coughs> more is better. These are called proportional factors. So the better you deliver on those, the higher customer satisfaction is becoming. Therefore, you have this proportional um, slope. And then what is most interesting, of course, is the delighters. So all this, they are not articulated, but if you deliver on the on, on those kind of um, factors, this is what the customer is not expecting. But if you're delivering on that, extreme satisfaction is being created. So I, I give you one example from my uh, service garage uh, where I have my car and inspected. So, um, I was changing uh, models a couple of years ago and um, I got a call from the um, from the manufacturer's garage and they said, yeah, we heard you bought yourself a new kind of car and uh, we want to offer our services to you. Um, you can have the car inspected at our garage and uh, because um, it may be due now for inspection. And I said, yes, okay, that's good because I changed brand, so I need a new kind of garage to take care of for the car. And uh, they said, Professor, when shall we pick it up at your home? And I said, what? Uh, yeah, we are coming uh, because your time is very valuable and um, you don't want to wait for something and you don't want to want to have a rental car. But what we are doing, we are coming with two, our, uh, two our, of our staff members with a rental car of your class. So you get, get the same kind of class. We're coming to your home where you live and we park the rental car in front of your home and you can have it all day free of charge and we take your car with us and in the evening when your car is inspected uh, and serviced we return it we exchange cars again at no extra cost and i said wow this is super cool because it saves me a lot of time it saves me a lot of time it's not so cumbersome so psychological costs are reduced um, so i said wow that is a great thing um, so that was a, uh, an example for customer delight or for delighter, delighting factor. The problem is, of course, however, what happens over time? Over time, delighters become must-be factors. Why is that? Because um, when Bosch and Daimler were introducing the first airbag systems, it was a wow factor. It was a delighter. Uh, it was new, it was an innovation, but now it is a must-be factor, which again puts an emphasis on the, on the importance of the fact to continuously innovate in order to stay ahead of the game. So, what is, a, what is an integrated marketing mix? What is it, is it all about? Integrated marketing mix means, like we mentioned before, you have to look at the four Ps, and this is what we are going to do in this lecture. First, product. Product is the core piece of marketing. It's the heart of marketing because without any product, without any service, you have nothing to market, right? So, but also you need to think about pricing. So what shall be the price of your product and your service? Shall, shall be the price the same for all of your customers? So, or shall you have a better price for students or a better price for people in the US or the better price for people in Asia? Because people in Asia, I don't know, they don't, they don't want, spend, want to spend so much on pencils or on cars or whatever or the other way around. So you need to think about all these kind of steps here. Uh, what I forgot, what is still, what is most important here in product is also uh, branding how to build strong brands. Promotion is the advertisement, but it's also personal selling, sales promotion, public relations, social media marketing, all this 
uh, is how you communicate um, your products and services and the customer value proposition to your respective customers. And the last question is, how how is your how's your distribution channels? How shall this be uh, this be managed? Right? Are you selling directly or indirectly, or are you selling what we call multiple channel multi channel strategy? Are you selling offline and online at the same time? So these are the questions which we are about to uh, to take care of. Okay. So I want to end it here. Unfortunately, we lost um, the start and uh, we are coming not as uh, as far as I <laughs> as I wanted, but I want to, uh, to spend the last couple of minutes to do the quiz. So I end the recording here, but I stay in the line. And first of all, I want to thank you for your uh, for your time and for your attention. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing you next week at the same um, same time here for another session of innovation management and marketing. Thanks very much. Take care and bye bye.